Okay, so we're going to talk about this poem called Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Um, the language that I'm speaking to you right now, as you may know, is English. And uh, English comes from England. England, as you may know, is an island. So for centuries, the literature, the poetry, the art that came from England uh, had to do with uh, boats and seafaring and voyages. And it was a big impact on uh, Romantic literature and also on the uh, Rhyme of the Age Mariner, which had a big impact on this novel Frankenstein. All right, so if you have your copy of Rhyme of the Age Mariner with you, mine's on paper. I guess you could use yours on a computer or laptop, but hopefully you can annotate and highlight parts of it. So this is like a story in the form of a poem and you, if I just told you, go ahead and read it, you probably would have a lot of difficulty. So I'm going to read it with you and ask you to annotate or mark the parts that are important. Okay, so you'll notice the spelling, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, is spelled in an unusual way. Coleridge is intentionally using language that he thought would be more colorful and create an atmosphere. He wanted to make it sound like it was from a long time ago. And uh, so he varies his spelling because uh, older stories sometimes are spelled differently. In fact, in the Renaissance, the writers and poets considered it a mark of sophistication to spell words differently, even in the same poem. Nowadays, we think if somebody spells words differently, they don't know how to spell. But in those times, they considered it a cool, uh, sophisticated thing. So that's why he calls it Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Ancient means a long time ago, an old guy. Mariner is just an old word for sailor. You may know the heard of the Seattle Mariners. Okay, there's also a Spanish, Hispanic, a song in Spanish. Yo no soy marinero, soy capitán. Okay, these come from the word mariner, which means sailor. So he's not a captain, he's a mariner. Okay, yo no soy capitán, soy marinero. Now anyway, okay. Uh, anyway, so let's take a look at this poem. Seven parts. Argument means like the main idea. How a ship, having passed the line, was driven by storms to the cold country towards the South Pole, and how from thence she made her course to the tropical latitude of the great Pacific Ocean, and of the strange things that befell, and in what manner the ancient mariner came back to his own country. Okay, so look at part one. By the way, these italics are where the Coleridge is explaining to the audience what's going on. Because when he first wrote this poem, it was popular, people liked it, but they kept sending him emails, no, not emails, I guess little messages on parchment saying, we have trouble understanding this. So he, he published uh, an explanation here. So it says, an ancient mariner meeteth three gallants bidden to a wedding feast and detaineth one. We'll see if I can put an image up of that. All right, so here you can see the mariner, the old mariner, putting his hand on one of the wedding guests, saying, stop. He detains him. The other two, one of three, the other wedding guests are hurrying off to the party, and he keeps this one wedding guest. Okay, so he says, It is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three. By thy long beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stoppest thou me? The bridegroom's doors are opened wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set, mayst hear the merry din? He holds him with his skinny hand. There was a ship, quoth he. Hold off, unhand me, greybeard loon. Eftsoons his hand dropped he. The wedding guest is spellbound by the eye of the old seafaring man and constrained to hear his tale. He holds him with his glittering eye. The wedding guest stood still and listens like a three years child. Mariner hath his will. The wedding guest sat on a stone. He cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man. The Bright-Eyed Mariner. Okay, so here's an artist's rendition of the Ancient Mariner uh, making the wedding guest listen to his story. All right? Kind of like when a teacher puts on a big, long video that you have to watch online. Oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, the Mariner hath his will, and thus spake on that ancient man, the Bright-Eyed Mariner. The ship was cheered, the harbor cleared, barely did we drop. Below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse top. Kirk is a word that means church, like a church building and a lighthouse. 
The Mariner tells how the ship sailed southward with again good wind and fair weather till it reached the line, line meaning the equator. The sun came up upon the left, out of the sea came he, and he shone bright and on the right went down into the sea. Higher and higher every day till over the mast at noon, the wedding guest here beat his breast, for he heard the loud bassoon. So he's like saying, oh, I'm missing the party. The wedding guest heareth the bridal music, but the mariner continueth his tale. The bride hath paced into the hall, red as a rose is she. Nodding their heads before her goes the marrow minstrelsy. The wedding guest he beat his breast, yet he cannot choose but hear, and thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. The ship was driven by a storm toward the South Pole. Okay, so he's telling the story about what happened. Okay, so the ship is driven towards the South Pole. I don't know if I skipped a few lines here, but anyway. And now the storm blast came, and he was tyrannous and strong. He struck with his o'ertaking wings and chased us south along. With sloping masts and dipping prow, as who pursued with yell and blow, still treads the shadow of his foe, and forward bends his head. The ship drove fast, loud roared the blast, the southward eye we fled. Okay, next page. And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold, and ice mass high came floating by, as green as emerald. Okay, so the land of ice, as they're on their ship, and this is an artist's interpretation of that. Okay. And through the sniffs, drifts the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen, nor shapes of men, nor beasts we ken, the ice was all between. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swound. Till a great sea bird called the albatross came through the snow fog and was received with great joy and hospitality. At length did cross an albatross, the row of the fog it came. As if it had been a Christian soul, we hailed it in God's name. It ate the food it ne'er had eat, and around and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder fit, the helmsman steered us through. And lo, the albatross proveth a bird of good omen, that means the bird brought them good luck, and followeth the ship as it returned northward through fog and floating ice. And a good south wind sprung up behind, the albatross did follow. And every day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. In Mr. Cloud and Master Shroud it perched for Vespers nine, whilst all the night through fog smoke white glimmered the white moonshine. The ancient mariner inhospitably killeth the pious bird of good omen. It doesn't say why he did this. Okay, the bird was bringing them good luck, and then all of a sudden, you see this little arrow going up towards the albatross. He decides to uh, to kill it. So the wedding guest says to him. God save the ancient mariner from the fiends that plague the fiends that plague thee thus. Why lookest thou so? With my crossbow I shot the albatross. Okay, so once he kills the bird, then curses start to fall on him and his crew members, his his, uh, his homies, his friends. Part two, the sun now rose upon the right. Out of the sea came he, still hid in mist, and on the left went down into the sea. And the south, good south wind still blew behind, but no sweet bird did follow, nor any day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. His shipmates cry out against the ancient mariner for killing the bird of good luck. And I had done a hellish thing, and it would work em woe, for all averred I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. Ah, wretch, said they, the bird to slay that made the breeze to blow. But when the fog cleared off, they justify the same thus make themselves accomplices in the crime. Now this is the part you should mark. That's important because the crew members partake in the crime and so when the punishments come around, uh, crew members suffer too. Okay? So, um, next part. Nor dim nor red, nor like God's own head, the glorious sun up wrist. Then all avert I had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist. Twas right, said they, such birds to slay that bring the fog and mist. The fair breeze continues, the ship enters the Pacific Ocean and sails northward, even till it reaches the line, meaning the equator. The fair breeze blew, the white foam flew, the furrow followed free. That's called the uh, onomatopoeia. We were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. Okay, the ship had been suddenly becalmed. 
Down dropped the breeze, the sails dropped down, t'was sad as sad could be. And we did speak only to break the silence of the sea. All in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun at noon, right up above the mast did stand, no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day, we stuck, nor breath nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Okay, in those times, people would fear no wind, more, I think probably even more than a storm, because without wind, of course, before the steam engine, ships could not move. And the albatross begins to be avenged. Page three now. Water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. The very deep did rot, O oh Christ, that ever this should be. Yea, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. Okay, so here's where they hang the albatross around the mariner's neck, according to, uh, this is an artist's interpretation. So the next part at the end of uh, part two, the last couple lines. Ah, well a day, what evil looks had I from old and young. Instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. Okay, part three, things are starting to get worse now. There passed a weary time, each throat was parched and glazed each eye. A weary time, a weary time, how glazed each weary eye. When looking westward I beheld a something in the sky. Something's coming towards them. The ancient mariner beholdeth a sign in the element afar off. Okay, so he sees something coming towards them, and he's horrified that it's coming without wind. So it's a haunted ship. It's like skeleton, but it's still floating. Okay, it gets towards them. Let's go towards the part where it appears. Um, let's look at the bottom of page three. Okay, so it says, um, Alas, I thought, and my heart beat loud, how fast she nears and nears. Are those her sails that glance in the sun like restless gossamers? The specter woman and her death mate, and no other aboard the ship. All right, let's turn to page four. Okay, so these are the two scary uh, creatures or, or spirits on the haunted uh, ship that comes up approaching them to uh, punish them for killing the, for what he did, killing the albatross. This is death, okay, and this is life and death. So this is an artist's interpretation of what death and life and death might have looked like. Uh, the only criticism I have of this is that they made life and death actually look kind of pretty, but the, in the, the one like this, she's supposed to be you know, really scary and evil and creepy. Although maybe having somebody look pretty could be even more creepy, sort of like Chucky in that movie, the little child's play doll that goes around, he looks all, and, and the clown uh, in, in the Stephen King movie. Uh, I can't remember the scary movie about the clown. It, um, I think. And, and sometimes somebody that looks nice and attractive uh, and it ends up being more dangerous, right? Okay, so. The specter woman and her death mate and no other aboard the skeleton ship. Okay? And those her ribs which through the sun did peer as through her gate. And is that woman all her crew? Is that a death and are there two? Is death that woman's mate? Like vessel, like crew. Okay, so this is describing life and death now. By the way, you should probably annotate and mark this, this part, page four, where these two uh, creatures come in uh, that are going to cause problems for them. So, her lips were red, her looks were free, her locks were yellow as gold. Her skin was white as leprosy. The nightmare, life and death was she, who thicks man's blood with cold. Okay, death and death, life, death and life and death have diced for the ship's crew, and she, the latter, winneth the ancient mariner. So life and death wins the mariner. Guess who wins the crew? Death. That's right. The naked hulk alongside came, and the twain were casting dice. The game is done. I've won, I've won, quoth she, and whistles thrice. No twilight within the courts of the sun. The sun whose rim dips, the stars rush out. At one stride comes the dark. With far heard whisper o'er the sea, off shot the specter bark. Ghost ship. Specter means ghost. Bark is an old word for ship, like the word embark, or in Spanish, barco. Okay. At the rising of the moon, we listened and looked sideways up. Fear at my heart as at a cup, my lifeblood seemed to sip. The stars were dim and thick the night. 
The steersman's face by his lamp gleamed white from the sails the dew did drip, till clomb above the eastern bar the horned moon with one bright star within the nether tip. One after another, his shipmates dropped down dead. Okay, remember death gets the crew, life and death gets the mariner. So all the crew members start dying now. One after one by the star-dogged moon, too quick for groan or sigh, each turned his face with a ghastly pang and cursed me with his eye. Four times fifty living men, and I heard nor sigh nor groan. With heavy thump, a lifeless lump, they dropped down one by one. Life and death begins her work on the ancient mariner. The souls did from their bodies fly. They fled to bliss or woe. And every soul that passed me by, whoosh, whoosh, like the whiz of my crossbow. Of course, he feels guilty now that all of his friends have died because of his action. By the way, does anyone see a parallel between this and the story of Frankenstein? If not, you will. Okay, one guy does something bad and everybody around him gets affected, okay? All his friends are dying, and now he's feeling horrible about it. Okay, part four starts, the wedding guest feareth that a spirit is talking to him. Okay, so the young man that's listening to this whole story says, I fear the ancient mariner, I fear thy skinny hand, and thou art long and lank and brown, as is the ribbed sea sand. I fear thee and thy glittering eye, and thy skinny hand so brown. Fear not, fear not, thou wedding guest, this body dropped not down. But the ancient mariner assureth him of his bodily life and proceedeth to relate his horrible penance. Okay, a penance is something somebody does to make up for a terrible sin. Okay, in some churches, if uh, somebody confess to a minister or a priest, they'll say, for your penance, go and make things better. Okay, so... Um, Part four, he, uh, he says, Fear not, fear not, this, thou wedding guest, this body drop not down. Okay, alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. And never a saint took pity on my soul in agony. He despiseth the creatures of the calm. So he looks at the animals and he feels hatred towards them. At the bottom of page four, uh, about seven lines from the bottom, or maybe eight lines from the bottom, well, ten lines from the bottom, he says, He despiseth the creatures of the calm. The many men so beautiful, and they all dead did lie, and a thousand, thousand slimy things lived on, and so did I. So he's by himself, feeling horrible that all his friends have died, and there's all the slimy things. So he despises these creatures. I looked upon the rotting sea and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the rotting deck, and there the dead men lay. I looked to heaven and tried to pray, but or ere a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as dust. I closed my lids and kept them close, and the balls like pulses beat. For the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay like a load on my weary eye, and the dead were at my feet. But the curse liveth for him in the eye of the dead man. Okay, turn to page five. The cold sweat melted from their limbs, nor rot nor reek did they. The look with which they looked on me had never passed away. An orphan's curse would drag to hell a spirit from on high, but oh, more horrible than that is the curse in a dead man's eye. Seven days, seven nights I saw that curse, and yet I could not die. So he feels really horrible. Let's skip the next few parts of that. Go down to about the middle of page uh, five. He starts to notice the animals. He takes another look and has a very different attitude. All right. So this is now about maybe in the, right in the middle of page five. See in the italics, it says, their beauty and their happiness, he blesseth them in his heart. So now he has a different attitude towards the creatures. And remember what caused all the problems was shooting at the albatross. See if you can think about the message here. Remember what I told you about the romanticism, the ideology is nature and respect for nature. Okay, so he has a different attitude now towards the creatures. That, oh, happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The spell begins to break. Okay? This selfsame moment I could pray, and from my neck so free, the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. Okay, so when he changes his attitude, 
towards the creatures instead of hating them. He starts to feel love towards them. The, the curse begins to break. Okay. All right. So look at the bottom of page five now. And this is the part that I think influenced uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, the ride, which later, later would influence the movies. All right. So it says about one, two, three, four, five, six lines from the bottom of page five. It says, the bodies of the ship's crew are inspired and the ship moves on. The loud wind never reached the ship, yet now the ship moved on. Beneath the lightning and the moon, the dead men gave a groan. They groaned, they stirred, they all uprose, nor spake nor moved their eyes. It had been strange, even in a dream, to have seen those dead men rise. The helmsman steered, the ship moved on, yet never a breeze up blew. The mariners all again worked the ropes where they were wont to do. So this is now page six. Website, uh, an artist depiction of the crew, and somebody's asking, is the ancient mariner a zombie? Well, I don't know, the living dead? Yeah, perhaps. The, all the dead bodies are now working the crew, uh, the uh, ropes and things, just like in Pirates of the Caribbean, where you see the skeleton steering the ship. You may recall if you've been on that ride at Disneyland. Of course, not lately because of the COVID thing, but uh, it is open. Uh, a lot of you have probably been there in the past, and you may remember in the ride, Pirates of the Caribbean. Okay, so let's continue. This is on page six now. They raised their limbs like lifeless tools. We were a ghastly crew. The body of my brother's son stood by me knee to knee. The body and I pulled out one rope, but he said not to me. Okay, but not by the end, souls of the men, nor by demons of middle earth or air, but by a blessed troop of angelic spirits sent down by the invocation of the garden, guardian saints. So the, these spirits are moving the dead bodies to work the rigging. I fear the ancient mariner, be calm thou wedding guest. T'was not those souls that fled in pain, which to their courses came again, but a troop of spirits blessed. For when it dawned, they dropped their arms and clustered round the mast. Sweet sounds rose slowly through their mouths and from their bodies passed. Okay, so it's talking about how they hear singing as the dead bodies are uh, working the ship. All right? Yo, ho, yo, ho, a pirate's life for me. Well, maybe not exactly like that. So anyway, next part, uh, let's go ahead and skip to uh, page seven. It talks about, well, actually, before we go on from page six, let me just ask you to mark um, one part that shows up in the novel Frankenstein. Okay, on page six, where it says, Well, never mind. No, I'm thinking of a wrong part. Not page six. Let's go on to page seven. Okay. So in about the middle of page seven, the mariner is telling his story. You should mark these lines here where it says um, about the middle of page seven. Like one that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round, walks on and turns no more his head because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. All right, so that, that these lines are used by Mary Shelley in Frankenstein. So you can mark that part, and that will come back a little bit later. All right, so continuing on page seven. Its path was not upon the sea, in ripple or in shade. It raised my hair and fanned my cheek like a meadow gale of spring. It mingled strangely with my fears, yet it felt like a welcoming. Swiftly, swiftly flew the ship, yet she sailed softly too. Sweetly, sweetly blew the breeze, on me alone it blew. And the ancient mariner beholdeth his native country. So he's being brought back now to England. O oh, dream of joy, is this indeed the lighthouse top I see? Is this the hill? Is this the kirk? Is this mine own country? Okay, we drifted o'er the harbor bar, and I with sobs did pray. Oh, let me be awake, my God, or let me sleep all way saying, if this isn't really happening, I don't want to live anymore. Okay, he's, feel like he's returning to England. The harbor bay was clear as glass, so smoothly it was strewn, and on the bay the moonlight lay, the shadow of the moon. The rock shone bright, the kirk no less, that stands above the rock. The moonlight steeped in silentness, the steady weathercock. Okay, so he's getting brought, being brought back into his native uh, harbor. 
Okay, we're getting towards the end of the poem, the end of the story. On page 8, the fifth line, if you look at the fifth line from the top of page 8, here's an illustration of what's going on. In those times when a big ship goes into a harbor, a small boat would row out to meet them, and the person that would guide them would be called the pilot. In this case, you have the pilot and the pilot's boy, like a young man that's helping him, and an old... Uh, it's called the hermit of the wood. He's supposed to be like a priest or a monk, like a religious guy who's going with them maybe uh, for company. And as he gets to the end of the story, he turns to the holy guy, the, the religious guy, and hopes that he's going to help him to uh, make up for the bad things that he's done. All right, so on page eight, the fifth line down. But soon I heard the dash of oars. I heard the pilots cheer. My head was turned perforce away, and I saw a boat up here. The pilot and the pilot's boy, I heard them coming fast. Dear Lord in heaven, it was a joy the dead men could not blast. I saw a third, I heard his voice, it is the hermit good. He singeth loud his godly hymns that he makes in the wood. He'll shrieve my soul, he'll wash away the albatross's blood. When it says he'll shrieve my soul, uh, shrieve means to... Uh, free him to absolve him of his sins. Okay, when Juliet in Romeo and Juliet says that she wants to go to Friar Lawrence, tells her parents she's going for shrift, uh, she's telling them that she wants to confess her sins uh, for turning against her father, when secretly she's actually going to marry Romeo. But anyway, so shrift, shrieve means uh, confess. So he, he's going to seek to become clean by uh, talking to the holy man, the priest. So uh, the next part where it says part seven, uh, he actually, which is actually the last part of the poem, I guess, um, he talks a bit about the hermit. This hermit good lives in that wood which slopes down to the sea. How loudly his sweet voice he rears. He loves to talk with mariners that come from a far country. He kneels at morn and noon and eve. He hath a cushion plump. It is the moss that wholly hides the rotted old oak stump. The skiff boat neared, I heard them talk. Why, this is strange, I trow. Where are those lights so many and fair, that signal made but now? <coughs> Approaches the ship with wonder. Strange by my faith, the hermit said, and they answered not our cheer. The planks looked warped, and see those sails, how thin they are and sear. I ne'er saw aught like to them, unless perchance it were, brown skeletons of leaves that lag my forest brook along. When the ivy tod is heavy with snow and the olet owlet whoops to the wolf below that eats the she-wolf's young. Okay, references to nature. Um, also in the, in the novel Frankenstein, there are frequent references to nature. Dear Lord, it hath the fiendish look, the pilot made reply. I am afeard. Push on, push on, said the hermit cheerily. The boat came closer to the ship, but I nor spake nor stirred. Okay. The boat came close beneath the ship, and straight a sound was heard. The ship suddenly sinketh. Under the water it rumbled on, still louder and more dread. It reached the ship, it split the bay. The ship went down like lead. Okay, the ancient mariner is saved in the pilot's boat. Okay, they pull him ashore. Stunned by that loud and dreadful sound, which sky and ocean smote, like one that hath been seven days drowned, my body lay afloat. But swift as dreams I, myself I found within the pilot's boat, Upon the whirl where sank the ship, the boat spun round and round, and all was still save that the hill was telling of the sound. I moved my lips, the pilot shrieked and fell down in a fit. The holy hermit raised his eyes and prayed where he did sit. I took the oars, the pilot's boy, who now doth crazy go, laughed loud and long, and all the while his eyes went to and fro. Ha ha, quoth he, full plain I see, the devil knows how to row. And now all in my own country, I stood on the firm land. The hermit stepped forth from the boat, and scarcely he could stand. The ancient mariner earnestly entreated him, the hermit, to shrieve him. And the penance of life falls on him. So now he says to the holy man, please shrieve me. Please uh, free me of my you know, sins and wrong. Okay, so here's an artist's depiction of the mariner asking the, uh, the holy man to shrieve him to free him from his sins. Okay, and then there's these two other guys looking over in, the, in this artist's prediction, pro, depiction, um, you know, looking over and saying, uh, WTF, uh, or 
I mean, what's that for, right? They're, they're like, whoa, okay. But anyway, that's what that stands for, right? Okay, so he says, Oh, shrieve me, shrieve me, holy man. The hermit crossed his brow. Say quick, quoth he, I bid thee say, What manner of man art thou? Forthwith this frame of mine was wrenched with a woeful agony, which forced me to begin my tale, and then it left me free. And ever and anon, throughout his future life, an agony constraineth him to travel from land to land. Okay, you should annotate this part because there's a psychology here. Psychologists tell you if you don't express something, um, you need to get something out to free yourself from it. Okay, if you keep it all inside, then you're like uh, not free of it. Okay, so that's his thing. Since then, at an uncertain hour, that agony returns. Until my ghastly tale is told, this heart within me burns. I pass like night from land to land. I have strange power of speech. That moment that his face I see, I know the man that must hear me. To him my tale I teach. Okay, so that's his curse, is that he has to go from land to land, and the first person he sees, he has to tell him his story. He has to say, I messed things up, and I want you to try to make things better. Okay, so this, this is how I messed up. The old guy telling the young person how you can do better. Okay, that moment that his face I see, to him my tale I teach. Now at the end of the poem, the doors open wide and all the people come out of the party, the wedding guests. So the beginning and the end of the poem is a very joyful thing, but all throughout the middle, everything's kind of serious and, and uh, scary. All right? So, what loud uproar bursts from that door? The wedding guests are there. But in the garden bower, the bride and bridesmaids singing are. And hark the little vesper bell, which biddeth me to prayer. O oh, wedding guest, this soul hath bone, been alone on a wide, wide sea. So lonely t'was that God himself scarce seemed there to be. O oh, sweeter than the marriage feast, tis sweeter far to me, to walk together to the kirk with a goodly company, to walk together to the kirk and all together pray, whilst each to his great father bends, old men and babes and loving friends, and youths and maidens gay and to teach by his own example, love and reverence to all things that God made and loveth. Okay, so you annotate the very end of the poem, the last uh, eight or nine lines, because that's really the moral of the story, is respect for nature. The idea that all these bad things happen because he shot the albatross, when he changed his attitude towards the creatures, everything seems to get a bit better. All right, I'm gonna see if I can do the last lines from memory. Farewell, farewell, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest. He prayeth well that loveth well, both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best that loveth best, all things great and small. Uh, I better check. Let me see if I have that. Okay, for the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. The wedding guest, uh, let's see. Uh, all right, I better get some help here. The mariner whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar. Uh, hoar spelled that way just means white. He has a white beard. His beard is hoar. Is gone. And now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. He went like one that hath been stunned and is of sense forlorn. A sadder and a wiser man he rose the morrow morn. Okay, so at the end of the poem, the young man has listened to the old man and has, has gotten a uh, uh, wisdom. He's sadder and wiser. Okay, the stereotype of young people is, hey dude, let's party. Um, you know, uh, like, uh, anyway, uh, people tend to think young people are more partying and having fun, not being serious, but of course in the poem, once they listen to the old guy, uh, they become serious. So if you listen to this whole uh, video and you actually listen to the old guy, you will uh, be wiser, a sadder and a wiser man. Well, I don't know about sadder, but you'll be hopefully wiser and more knowledgeable. All right, before we conclude, one more movie clip. Um, maybe you've heard of someone named Robert Redford and Meryl Streep. All right, here's a movie clip. Okay, so as we wrap up this uh, long video lecture presentation, uh, I'm going to show you a clip from a film called Out of Africa, one of my favorite films based on the life, the bi autobiography of Isaac Dinesen, um, whose name originally was Karen Blixen, and she lived in Africa for a while. 
and uh, she wrote her autobiography, and this film came out in the mid-80s. It won seven Academy Awards, and it has a quote from uh, a poem that you are hopefully now familiar with. So here's uh, the clip from Out of Africa with Robert Redford and Meryl Streep. I can fix that, I think. Laughed loud and long, and all the while his eyes went to and fro. Ha <laughs> ha, quoth he, full plain I see. The devil knows how to roll. Farewell, farewell. You skip verses. Well, I leave out the dull parts. Farewell, farewell. But this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest. They had that. He prayeth well, he loveth well, both man and bird and beast. Okay, so. Farewell, farewell, but this I tell to you, my online class guests. You will do well if you read and study and listen to uh, the Karsten's video pest. Well, at least I'm not ending with my face. You can see Meryl Streep. Until next time, farewell. <laughs>